Remembered when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Barry Sullivan in Powder Mission on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. On our Hallmark Playhouse tonight, the eve of Washington's birthday, we dramatize a story by Herbert E. Stover called Powder Mission, a story which, through the mirror of fiction, well conveys the atmosphere of those early days in our country's history when the great issue was still in doubt and when, under Washington's leadership, the meaning of the word American was in process of being forged. Those were also the days of perils and gallantries and intrigues, when the Mississippi was the highway of war as well as trade, and when a young man sailing downstream to the Spanish city of New Orleans had to be careful of his friends as well as of his enemies. Such a man was our hero tonight, and to play his part we are happy to have with us that fine actor, Barry Sullivan. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the right words. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it, and in the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Our star tonight, Barry Sullivan, is appearing by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical, The Bell of New York, starring Fred Astaire, Vera Ellen, and Marjorie Maine. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Herbert E. Stover's Powder Mission, starring Barry Sullivan. summer of 1777, along the Atlantic seaboard, the armies of King George and of the Continental Congress fought and retreated and fought again. But to the west, across the Alleghenies, there were no great armies, no desperate battles. There, the war of the revolution was fought with stealth and cunning, by forces sometimes invisible and always deadly. It was to join this war that the young, young man with a Dutch name and buckskin clothing spurred his horse down the western ridges of the Alleghenies. The day was hot, and I was thirsty. And then I saw an opening in the woods, and a creek. I reined in my horse, dismounted, and carried my water flask down to the stream. Just as I raised the container from the water, it hit. The water spattered through a hole in the flask, the bullet hole. I reached for my rifle and then thought better of it. In a half ring behind me stood a dozen Indians and a white man with a red beard. Where are you bound, stranger? Fort Pitt. Pitt, eh? Your business? I'm a trapper. Mm-hmm. Been on the trail long? Several days. Your name? Jacob Dorn. How do I know it is? Well, I haven't any papers to prove it. Uh, you can read the nameplate on my powder horn. Mm-hmm. Back along the trail, did you run across a fellow called Richter? Richter? Martin John Richter. No, I didn't. Mm. All right, I guess you can go. You ought to make Fort Pitt by sundown. Before he had time to change his mind, I was on my horse and splashing across the stream. 
It was true that I hadn't met anyone on the trail named Martin Richter. <laughs> How could I have met myself? It was night when I reached Fort Pitt. I went directly to the quarters of Colonel Gibson. He sent his orderly out of the room and motioned me to a chair beside his desk. And now, Richter, give me the news. Well, Washington's army is still near Philadelphia, sir. He's playing the hare to the British hounds. Yes, well, it's a dangerous game. Can't go on much longer. The army knows it. Every day there are more desertions. Washington is crippled for men and money and powder. The same applies to us out here. British control most of the rivers. They send raiding parties down from Fort Detroit. And they've got their allies among the Redskins. Men, money, and powder. Without them, all we can do is sit here inside our stockade and wait for the inevitable. It's inevitable, yes, if we wait. But there's already been too much waiting in this war, Victor, sir. did General Washington tell you why he was sending you out here to us? No, sir. Mm. Only that I was to be his personal representative in some kind of action. Why he picked me when I'm no longer an officer. Because he trusts you. He wrote me a letter saying that you were being mustered out because of a wound, but that your services will be even more valuable as a civilian. But how, sir? Richter, when you came into the fort, perhaps you noticed a flatboat moored at the landing. I did. Well, it's loaded with corn, shingles, and bear hams. So far as anyone knows, the cargo is going down to New Orleans for sale. Uh -huh. And the crew is to be made up of a few immigrants bound for Louisiana. I see. Up to now, everyone believes that, including the British spies here in the fort. And the real purpose, sir? Powder, tons of powder waiting mm. for us in New Orleans. Spanish governor is willing to sell for a price, and you will pay it to him. I, sir? As General Washington's personal envoy, you will accompany us, and the money will be in your safekeeping. If there's trouble on the river, defend it with your life. Well, if there's trouble, I'll welcome it. I took a redcoat bullet in my chest. I want the chance to repay it. Yeah, it's not the redcoats you'll be fighting. Well, we may have a brush with them, but at least they fight honorably. Well, I see. Then uh, river pirates? Yes, yes. There's a renegade white man by the name of Hartland. Uh -huh. On land, he works with the Indians. And on the river, he's had a fleet of boats manned by escaped criminals. He's in the British pay, but his services belong to the devil himself. Uh, Colonel Gibson. Uh, that's enough of serious talk for now. It's mess time. You must be hungry. Yeah, one moment, sir. Hmm? I was stopped on the trail today by a white man leading some Indians. He had uh, red hair, red beard, and a scar on his left cheek. Yeah. Would that be Hartland? That would be Hartland, yes. Yeah. And you're lucky to be here with a whole scalp. I wondered whether it was by luck or by some design of Hartland. I'd slipped through his fingers almost too easily. Yes, and how had Hartland known Martin Richter was coming to Fort Pitt? Someone in General Washington's confidence had talked. Or worse still, was a spy. Two nights later, Colonel Gibson and I went aboard the flatboat. Under my coat, I carried a heavy leather pouch destined for the governor of New Orleans. The powder mission was on its way. Quietly now, men, cast off and head for the middle of the stream. Cast off, cast off. Remember, no lights, no smoking, and no loud talking. I made my way past a long, low log cabin in the center of the boat, made myself comfortable in the stern. Behind me, towering against the sky, was the figure of the steersman, a huge bearded Scotsman. Uh, McPhail. I... McPhail, what's the meaning of that tuft of wool in your cap? Every one of the crew seems to be wearing it. Aye. It's the badge of the lambs. Huh? We're irregulars. Meek as lambs. Till we see a red coat. <laughs> and then off with sheepskins and your fighting wolves, eh? <laughs> McPhail. Aye, there's females aboard, too. A pretty one. And her servant girl. Hello. Do you mind if I sit down here with you? It's stuffy inside the cabin. Whatever you wish. My name's Hester Jordan. And yours? <laughs> All right, I know it anyway. You're Martin Richter, Colonel Gibson told me. I don't remember seeing you around the fort. Because I was there only a few hours. I just arrived in Philadelphia. I'm going to New Orleans to visit my brother. You're puzzled, aren't you? It's a long, hard trip to New Orleans. A flatboat is no place for a woman. Oh, but you're wrong, Mr. Richter. Emigrants and their wives travel the river all the time. That's why Colonel Gibson was glad to have me. I... 
help complete the deception. I don't know what you're talking about. There's no deception. Isn't there? You've nothing to hide from the British gunboats or Hartman and his river pirates. Is that what you think? I think you'd better go back to your cabin. <laughs> Perhaps I should. Well, good night, Mr. Vick. I stared at the river, gleaming faintly in the moonlight, and wondered. Hester Jordan. Yes, it was a simple name, but she wasn't a simple girl. Somehow she didn't belong here. Somehow... Suddenly I heard a wild cry out in the darkness. I jumped for my rifle. McPhail! Not yet, sir. That's only a mountain pamper. When it's the pirates, you'll know right enough. The speed of the flatboat was the speed of the Ohio River, and that seemed unendurably slow. And then, almost within sight of the Mississippi, McPhail's words were true. Wait till their boats come alongside, boys, and give them everything we've got. fired at them from the protection of the cabin and from behind bales of cargo. They'd come out at us in three longboats, white men and Indians, but only one boat returned to the riverbank. Victor, how many casualties? One killed and five wounded, sir. Did you count yourself? Your arm, man, your sleeve is soaking. Only a flesh wound, sir. Well, take care of it, because we haven't seen the last of Hartland. Hartland, he's not as smart as I thought he was, sir. The cargo we're carrying certainly isn't worth his trouble. No, but the cargo you're carrying is... Colonel, Colonel, how many know about the money bag? Just three. You and I and Hartland. And one more, sir. The spy who told Hartland. That evening, the flatboat reached the brown waters of the Mississippi. The air was hot and steaming, and low in the southern sky, the lightning flashed and flickered. Mr. Rickman. Yes? If I may, I'd like to change that bandage on your arm. I can take care of it. But I've already torn up one of my petticoats and made a fresh bandage for you, please. Uh, all right. Thanks. Oh, oh. oh. easy. Sorry. Yeah. How's that? Fine, thank you. Uh, Mr. Richter. Yes? You keep pretty much to yourself. You always seem to be thinking of something... Far away, what is it? Mm -hmm. The war, when it'll be over, when I can go back to my farm. Your farm? Yeah, it's on the banks of the Susquehanna. Oh, and did you, uh, did you live there by yourself? Yes, by myself. Why are you staring at me? I'm not. Well, you were during that flash of lightning. I was thinking, you're very pretty. Martin, there's something I must tell you. I want to warn you. About what? Don't carry that money bag with you all the time. Hide it somewhere in the cargo. So you know, and that's how Hartland knows. Martin, listen to me. I walked away. I didn't want to hear any more. I have decided to report it to Colonel Gibson, but something held me back. Yeah, I would wait and see. <laughs> A week later, we sighted the levees of New Orleans. Without further trouble from Hartland or the British patrol boats, I drew a deep breath. The powder mission was going to succeed. And then, suddenly, I wasn't so sure. When Hester Jordan and her maid left the flatboat, they were met by a carriage and an officer in the uniform of the British Army. to the second act of Powder Mission, starring Barry Sullivan. You've often heard the remark, perhaps at times you've even voiced it yourself, if I could only be there. It's much easier to talk than it is to write. It's four times when you can't be there in person, or when you fear your speech won't be equal to an important occasion, that you can rely on Hallmark cards. They are excellent ambassadors to carry your thoughts to other people. That's because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it. 
First by the use of words, the warm, simple words that express true feeling. Then by surrounding those words with beauty. You might say the colorful designs on Hallmark cards are like the smiles and gestures and inflections that help put your feeling across when you're talking in person. And that's the reason Hallmark cards are so universal that friendly, person-to-person way of carrying your thoughts to others and doing it in a manner that... Re- that's why you'll find discriminating people instinctively look for Hallmark on the back of any card they send or receive. For that Hallmark on the back also carries a message. It says, you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of Powder Mission, starring Barry Sullivan. half of the dangerous enterprise had been accomplished. The flatboat had reached New Orleans and was ready now to receive its cargo of Spanish gunpowder. Success appeared sure, and yet Martin Richter was uneasy. A British spy could cost them their mission and their lives, and he had seen Hester Jordan leave the flatboat on the arm of a British officer. Colonel Gibson and I waited on the boat for word from the Spanish governor, word that he was ready to do business with us. Finally, that word came, and Gibson and I went immediately to His Excellency's headquarters. I handed the governor the leather pouch which I had guarded for so many weeks. Governor Ungatha emptied the gold onto his desk and then turned to us with a smile. Everything is in order, gentlemen. The powder will be delivered to your boat at once. Thank you, Your Excellency. However, I regret to say, Colonel Gibson, that you are now under arrest. I what? But, Your Excellency... Gentlemen, I... New Orleans is filled with British soldiers and British agents. Your mission is already known to them. And since Spain must appear to be neutral, I am forced to make a uh, token arrest. Ah. I'm very sorry. Richard? Yes, sir? From now on, you are in command of the mission. Load the powder and head back to Fort Pitt without a moment's delay. I'll do my best, sir. See that you do, Senor Richter. For your cargo is not only explosive, it is most precious. I returned to the flatboat with a feeling of growing danger. Colonel Gibson had been arrested. Was it the work of Hester Jordan? And if so, when would the next blow fall? By midnight, the kegs of powder were aboard, and I headed the flatboat out into midstream. Now there was no drifting with the current. The heavy, ungainly boat must be pulled and pushed upriver. Every inch, every yard, every mile was an exhausting struggle. The daylight hours held risk of British patrol craft, and the nights brought a more mysterious danger. Mr. Richter, sir. Yeah, yes, McPhail, I hear it. I heard it last night and the night before. That sounds like muffled door locks. But is it the British or the river pilot? It makes little difference. Either one, they're enemies. Our provisions began to run low. And finally, with Fort Pitt only two days farther upstream, we were completely without food. I ordered the flatboat into shore, and while half the crew stood guard, the rest of us went into the woods in search of game. We hadn't gone far when we heard it. We raced back to the water's edge. Mr. Richter, the flatboat, it's gone. Aye, and there's what's left of our crew, floating in the shallows. Yes, with arrows in their backs. So it was Hartland who was following us. We were on foot and helpless to overtake Hartland. Our nearest aid was at Fort Pitt. And so we plunged into the forest, marching by compass and by instinct. The following night, we staggered into the fort, and I reported to General Leith, the commandant. You understand what this means for you, Ricky? You're in charge of the mission. You acted as General Washington's personal envoy. The Cartland can't have gone far, sir. He probably sneaked past the fort here during the night and is heading for the British in Canada. Give me men and bolts, and I'll get that powder back. The powder? To the devil with that. It's the gold that matters. The gold? General? Yes. The powder was only a ruse, a disguise. You picked up 200 barrels of powder in New Orleans, and 20 of them were filled with gold. Gold sent by the French to pay for our war through another winter. General, why wasn't I told if I had known? I think you did know. I think your story of Hartland is a lie. Sir? You've hidden the gold somewhere. By heavens, you'll rot in the guardhouse until you're ready to hand it over. Guard, seize this man. thought a 
traitor. Word would be sent to General Washington of the man he had so trusted. No, no, I mustn't think about it. I stared through my cell window toward the river up which Hartland was even then escaping. And then behind me, I heard the rattle of keys. Martin. Hester. I thought I was rid of you in New Orleans. I came overland by horse. I've bribed the guards and got the keys. I want no help from a British spy. Listen to me. McPhail and Randolph and the rest of the crew are waiting for you. They've got whale boats. Martin, go after the gold. Then, then you don't believe I stole it? No, Hartland did. Martin, this is your only chance to clear your name. Yes. If I could trust you. You can. Then I will, because I have to. She hadn't lied. My old crew was waiting with two fast whale boats. I turned to thank Hester, but she'd already climbed into the lead craft. I sat down beside her and gave the signal to the oarsman. I knew you'd let me come along, Martin. For only one reason. You can't make trouble for me. Martin, you still think I'm a spy because... because I knew about the money bag you carried with you to New Orleans. Yes. That money came from my father. I brought it from Philadelphia to pay for your powder missions. You want me to believe that you're also an agent for General Washington? Yes. I went along on the flatboat in case something should happen. In case I stole the money. Oh, no, Martin. If the boat should be captured by the Redcoats, I was to arrange for your release. You see, my brother is a high officer in the British Army. Uh, would he be the officer who met you in New Orleans? Yes. The oh. war has divided our family, but not our love for each other. Now, do you still distrust me? No. No. And yet, why did Hartland follow us? How did he know? Someone on our trip to New Orleans was in communication with Hartland, but who? You must be able to guess that by now. Think, Martin. Colonel Gibson. Yes. That was the real reason Governor Ungartha arrested him. A great burden seemed to lift from my shoulders. Hester was innocent. Now, if we could only overtake Hartland. And then, just as dawn was graying in the east, I saw an empty barrel floating downstream. It was one of the kegs from the flatboat. Hartland was already counting the gold, and he was just ahead of us. We rounded a bend in the river, and there was the flatboat tied up at the bank. There was a bonfire on shore and a score of Indians sleeping about us. What'll we do, sir? Well, they outnumber us at least four to one, so we don't dare attack. Clark and Randolph, you'll board the boat at the stern. Yes, sir. McPhail and Evans, you'll climb over the bow. If you find guards on watch, dispose of them quietly. There must be no sound. There'll be none, sir. Martin will have the kegs of gold all in one place. When we find them, we'll load them into the whaleboat. Martin. Yes? If Hartland discovers us... I'll decide that when it happens. Hester, I'm sorry. About what? That I was fool enough to let you come along. <laughs> My plan worked smoothly, up to a point. We sneaked aboard the flatboat, found the gold, and had loaded all but the last two kegs into the longboat. McPhail! McPhail, get those kegs into the whaleboat! Hurry! Hey, sir! Now, one of those power kegs! Martin! Martin, come on, you can't fight alone! Here, help me pour this powder along the deck. Just appearing around the bend of the river? Yes. Flag of Fort Pitt. Uh-huh. Your mission is ended. Yeah. In a few days, the gold will go over the mountains to the Continental Congress. Arms, men, and powder. General Washington will have them all, and the war will go on till we win. And, and you, Martin, when it's oh. all over? Oh. I'll go back to my farm on the Susquehanna. And I to Philadelphia. Now, it's strange when I left. I, I was so terribly homesick. And then when I came to Fort Pitt, I began to realize that comfort and ease mattered little. Other things are more important. Hester. Yes? Hester, when I left you in New Orleans, you could have sailed home to Philadelphia. Instead, you came back to Fort Pitt. You must know why. Uh, I wasn't sure. 
I hoped it might be because... But I've misunderstood you so many times. No, that's all, Pat. Hester, if you could see my farm in the springtime... It must be lovely. Oh, yes, it is. The fields are rolling green. The air is filled with birds. And the trees bloom pink and white like a woman's cheek. Like your cheeks. And the house? It's small. But big enough to shelter love. Oh, darling. I can almost see it. I want you to. You must, and you will. Oh, Hester, let's go home. and James Hilton will return in a moment. You know, when you stop to think about it, a greeting card is quite a bit different from most of the things you buy. And because it's always a gift from you to other people, the card you select represents you to your friends and loved ones. It carries your thoughts and feelings as if on a magic carpet, takes you visiting across the miles, across the years, often merely across the way. This is why the makers of Hallmark cards consider the message on every card so very important. Or you can always find a Hallmark card that seems to have been written especially for you. One that says what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. Because Hallmark cards can always be sent with pride and are always received with pleasure. Discriminating people have come to look for Hallmark on the back of any card they send or receive. They know that Hallmark means you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you, Barry, for your excellent performance as Martin. You certainly brought a fine adventure story to life for us. Well, it was an exciting role to play, Mr. Hilton. And with Washington's birthday tomorrow, it was certainly an appropriate choice for tonight. That was rather how we felt when we chose it. Uh, you have a reputation, though, for choosing appropriate stories for Hallmark Playhouse. But I guess that's as it should be. Because I've always noticed there always seems to be an appropriate Hallmark card when you need one. Uh, no matter what the occasion. Those are kind words, Barry, and thanks again for being with us. It was really a pleasure. What story do you have scheduled for next week? Next week, we shall tell the story of a delightful American family in one of life's familiar situations when we present Mother of the Groom by Harriet Fitzryan. And as our star, we shall have that talented Hollywood actress, Ruth Hussey. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The role of Hester tonight was played by Betty Lou Gerson. Others in our cast included Tom Tully, Ben Wright, Herb Butterfield, and Ted DeCorsio. Every Sunday afternoon on television, Hallmark Cards presents Sarah Churchill, who brings you the story of interesting people on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Consult your local newspaper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time, when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Ruth Hussey in Harriet Fitz Ryan's Mother of the Groom. And the week following, Rupert Hughes' Man Without a Home, starring Joseph Cotton. And the week after that, Anne Crone's This Pleasant Lee on the Hallmark Playhouse. <laughs> Thank you for the familiar that will be heard on the most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.